Thank you so much for joining the 10th Asia Pacific Water Forum webinar. My name is Yumiko Asayama, manager of Japan Water Forum and also the secretariat of the Asia Pacific Water Forum. Today, we welcome four speakers from Water Integrity Network, Green Climate Fund Independent Integrity Unit, and Infrastructure Transparency Initiative and discuss the importance of strengthening integrity in water sector to enhance water security in Asia Pacific for their sustainability and also resilience. Today's webinar is 90 minutes webinar, followed by the opening remarks from Mr. Rabinarayaran, chair of the APWF. We will have for presentation, each presenter will present 15 minutes presentation. Followed by the, their presentation, we will organize Q&A session, which is moderated by Mr. Rabinarayaran. Mr. Rabinarayaran will firstly ask questions to all speakers based on their presentation, followed by some Q&A between facilitator and also the speaker, we will also respond to the question from audience. So please ask any question to the speaker making use of the Q&A box. We will try to collect the question as much as possible. If time was not accepted to respond to all questions, or the speaker will respond to the question by email after the webinar. So please feel to ask any question to the speakers. Thank you so much for your cooperation. And now I would like to invite Mr. Rabinayala to deliver your opening remarks of today's webinar. Now, Rabbi, the floor is for yours. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> well, let me add my greetings and good wishes and thanks to all the participants of this 10th webinar of the Asia Pacific Water Forum in the lead up to the fourth Asia Pacific Water Summit. This is on a very important subject of integrity, which unfortunately is not discussed as much as it should, but is a crucial part of governance. In an earlier webinar, the OECD pointed out that governance was weak without participation and trust. And trust is built by transparency and uh, <clears throat> the ability to extract accountability, which is very much part of the whole process of integrity. Now, <clears throat> as we go forward, if we want to turn integrity as intention to integrity as practice, we will have to look at a number of things, including the process by which increasing the increasing amounts of funds that are flowing into the sector, including new types of funding, such as the Green Climate Fund, are operated, what the choke points and barriers are, which form the, form the points at which corruption grows, and how we can anticipate and intercept these sources of corruption so that we get a proper system of governance, which can earn the trust of people and then help the, to advance the sustainable development goals. Without further ado, um, Yumiko has already mentioned the speakers, so I'm not gonna, I'm just going to mention their names and invite them to take the floor, starting with Barbara Schreiner. But before I do so, let me request all the presenters to kindly stay within your 15 minutes because if you don't, you cut into the time of the next speaker. And not only that, it's not a very good advertisement for integrity. <laughs> You're not able to stick to your allotted time. So please stick within your allotted time, make your points forcefully. And we, have, we hope to have a terrific debate. And when your turn finishes, instead of coming back to me, please pass it on to the next speaker. So it's Barbara followed by Ibrahim, followed by Maria followed by Vinay. And they are gonna present, uh, you know, actual practice. So this is not just theoretical waffle. 
this is going to be tools and techniques and processes that ranging from policy to app to implementation that help to take the process of integrity forward. So let me first ask Barbara to please take the floor and start the process. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much, um, Ravi. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, sorry, I'm just, I hope that everybody can, can see my, my screen yes. and thank you very much for putting me on the spot. Uh, in terms of integrity and making sure that I get through this in 15 minutes, I will do my, my absolute uh, best. Um, so, so let me just start very briefly with a little bit about the Water Integrity Network, uh, which is an organization that is committed to strengthening integrity uh, and improving performance and reducing corruption in the water and sanitation sector, and looking at how that links to the human rights to water and, and the delivery of SDG 6 in particular. We work with a network of partners at the global, regional and, and local level, and we work through advocacy, through research, through capacity development, and uh, as you were saying, Ravi, through tools that are actually can be practically used to, to improve integrity um, in, in different levels of organizations. And we're very much focused on that positive thing of actually improving in integrity. And we work with government, with NGOs, with water services providers, uh, and with utilities. Um, at the moment across three continents. So just as an example of some of the tools uh, that, that we might be referring to, um, and I think we'll come back to this later, we have developed and implemented an integrity management toolbox, which can be used with utilities, with regulators, policymakers, large and small water supply systems, through a participatory process that identifies uh, integrity risks and helps to develop a roadmap for actually taking action to reduce those risks and to improve integrity. And we've implemented this uh, and other partners have across Latin America, East Africa and, and Asia. Another uh, concrete thing that we're doing is we're currently working with the aqua rating team to include integrity indicators in the aqua rating tool so that utilities can measure themselves on an integrity basis and, and not just on a, more, on a more technical basis. But what are we talking about when we're talking about integrity? We talk about it as the use of vested power and resources ethically and honestly for the provision of sustainable and equitable water and sanitation services in the public interest. It's implicit in the human rights obligations, it's explicit in the administrative laws of many countries, and it is operationalized through the principles of transparency, accountability, participation and anti-corruption, what we call TAPA in, 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 in the short form. And I think we're all aware of the fact that lack of integrity contributes to, to a, a wide range of challenges, waste of financial resources, both capital and maintenance. And estimates are that this can be anywhere between five and, and 30% of, of cost. It can result in poor infrastructure quality, poor service delivery, overpriced, overdesigned systems, <clears throat> poor performance, and ultimately significant social and economic challenges. And just to look briefly at how this might play out. Um, we, if you take procurement corruption in infrastructure project, there are, there are costs associated with that corruption at the point of, of the corruption in the procurement. That might result in increased costs for the project, poor delivery of the project, inappropriate design. The costs start to go up there, the costs of the corruption. Those that in turn lead to the reduction of available funds for other projects, increased maintenance and refurbishment costs, poor service delivery, and there's a feedback loop amongst those. Those might give rise to poor water quality, interrupted or no supply, lack of safely managed uh, uh, sanitation, for example. Again, your costs are starting to go up. On the right-hand side, you then get a whole lot of problems where you're actually seeing social and economic costs kicking in, uh, which might include lack of trust in, 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 in government, uh, interruptions in ability to, to uh, do economic uh, activities um, and certainly health costs. And the, so the costs of that one procurement in corruption in an, in an infrastructure project start skyrocketing into social and economic costs. Um, the estimates, purely on a financial basis, estimates from the ADB are that $53 billion per year need to be invested in Asia in water and sanitation by 2030. If we take the figures from an intra-American development bank study recently done, which show that reducing corruption can lead to financial savings, and I'm not talking about the social and economic costs, 
purely the financial savings of 7 to 16 percent in the water sector. 53 billion times 10 percent, which we take as the, somewhere in the middle of that range, means a possible saving purely in financial costs of 5.3 billion US dollars per year. The impacts of corruption are significant. The benefits of investing in integrity are equally significant. If we look at the findings from the, from the Asian Water Development Outlook from 2020, uh, where there was a regional survey conducted against the water governance principles of the OECD. And you look at some of the key aspects that are integral to improving integrity, data and information, actual integrity itself, stakeholder engagement, the participation that I referred to, monitoring and, eva <coughs> and evaluation, because without monitoring and evaluation, you actually don't know how you're doing and, and where you're going. You will see that, that, uh, the, that Asia scores enormously weakly, uh, very poorly on those critical issues that are necessary to drive integrity. And so there is a huge improvement that is required to ensure that integrity in the water sector, water and sanitation sector is improved and therefore can improve uh, performance and efficiency uh, in the water and sanitation sector in the Asia region. Just to highlight a couple of things, um, if one's looking at the OECD governance principles and the survey results, less than 20% of ADB members have implemented the relevant international conventions, have institutional anti-corruption plans uh, or tools to track budget uh, transparency in place. Only one third of the surveyed ADB members have implemented, implemented formal mechanisms to engage stakeholders in water related topics. And there are generally no formal requirements for evaluation monitoring in two thirds of the ADB members. So huge room for improvement. Um, if, we, if we look at, at um, just some positive things that have, have actually happened to, to give, as Ravi was saying, this is about, about what can be done and some real tools and practices. South Cotabato Provincial Government in the Philippines in 2015 launched something called the South Cotabato Integrity Circle, a multi-stakeholder forum. Multi-stakeholder forums are incredibly important and useful in preventing corruption. And the SCIC is mandated to develop and monitor effective implementation of South Cotabato's mechanisms for institutional integrity, and it applies to all public services in the province. They joined the, the, the uh, Open Governance Partnership in local in 2018, and currently have five commitments on open government to make public procurement more transparent. Public procurement being an incredibly important area to take action. They've been introducing open contract mechanisms to increase access to information, strengthen participation and transparency in project monitoring and so, and so on. And the province is consistently ranked amongst the most, one of the most competitive provinces in the country and has steadily reduced poverty since the launch of the initiative. If we look at another, at another one, and this is, this is looking specifically at, at the issue of, of uh, of gender and how bringing women into the picture can also help. In 2014, the Indonesian Corruption Eradication Commission, KPK, launched a program called Saya Perempuan Anti-Corruptsi, and I apologize uh, for my accent. Uh, I'm a woman against corruption, uh, abbreviated as SPAC. SPAC recognizes the diverse experiences of women in relation to corruption and that the experiences of women are often different from the experiences of men. They offer three-day training to groups of, of, of women. The training is designed to be fun and to appeal to different women, groups of kinds of women. It clarifies issues. What is petty corruption? What is the inappropriate use of public resources? How does, it, well, how does one get involved in the, in the fight against corruption? And they have seven games, one of which relates, for example, to village budgets and how you can participate in monitoring in the local use of, of funds. And it reveals how women can be active agents of anti-corruption in their communities and at, at all levels. A, th a third example is around e-procurement, and I've mentioned that procurement is a, is a very critical area of the battle against uh, corruption. What we find is, despite how important this area is, information is often not easily available. Uh, and e-procurement can really support improvements in terms of the access to information. The Open Contracting Partnership promotes e-procurement and a, a format for data sharing, which is the Open Contracting Data Standards, OCDS, which uses simple data structure, open data publication patterns, and gives guidance on how to improve data collection and quality. In the Ukraine, the civil society, private sector, and government reformers worked together, once again, a multi-stakeholder -stake group, to develop something called ProZoro, 
uh, an e-procurement system based on the OCDS. Prozoro means transparent. In the first few years, the savings amounted to more than a billion US dollars and thousands of new businesses were able to compete for contracts. 80% of contracts were then going to SMEs. There was a reduction in the perception of corruption by 50%. Prozoro simplifies the contracting process and reduces the cost of, of participation. And it's used by watchdog groups like Transparency International and the IDA Center to be able to monitor and detect what is actually going on. Uh, they've also now been training journalists uh, on how to use ProZorro, journalists also being an incredible ally uh, in the fight against corruption and in order to promote integrity. So what have we learned about, about uh, improving integrity? There is no magic bullet. There's no simple formula that can be applied, but with strong leadership, commitment, building coalitions, uh, using available tools and processes, change can be brought about even where there is system, systemic corruption. But it's important that actions are appropriate to the context and based on a risk assessment of the particular context. There is no plug and play. It also requires a change management process. Tackling corruption, improving integrity is not a once-off event, it is a process. Combining top-down and bottom-up processes can be effective and I come back, multi-stakeholder partnerships can be powerful drivers of change. Civil society and the media have a critical role to play. The voices and women and, of women and the youth can also be incredibly powerful in these processes. So just a couple of, 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 of recommendations uh, then for water sector organizations. Integrity plans at the organizational level can be a very powerful tool to strengthen corporate governance, support a culture of integrity, improve organizational performance, credibility, and creditworthiness. Improved integrity also, critically, serves to safeguard the most vulnerable from the negative impacts of, of corruption. Some recommendations for international donors and agencies. Uh, please support and align with local partners for integrity management, building the capacity of stakeholders, including the poor, to participate, monitor, and hold service providers accountable, rather than focusing too much on infra infrastructure construction without the attached governance and integrity elements to it. And coordinate with other national anti-corruption governmental organizations around training and advocacy and capacity building. And then recommend, recommendations for, for governments. Uh, in, recognize that integrity measures are a good place to invest because they promote good governance and financial invest in efficiency, leading to quality growth, inclusive, participatory, sustainable, and resilient growth. And then a final recommendation, we think it would be great to if include integrity and the human rights approach in the water and sanitation uh, fourth uh, APWS declaration document, the Kumamoto declaration, which is, is, is going to be developed for next year. And Ravi, I do hope that I have managed to do that in time and I'm gonna get an accolade for, 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 for having stuck to time. Um, and on that note, I then wish to hand over uh, to um, Ibrahim Pam, who, as has been mentioned, is the head of the Independent Integrity Unit at the Green Climate Fund. Ibrahim, over to you, and let me try to stop sharing now. Uh, many thanks, Barbara. Um, and it's my pleasure to be uh, on this uh, panel. Um, I am pleased to share an overview of the work that we're doing at the Independent Integrity Unit of the Green Climate Fund um, in building integrity into the operations of the fund and with specific reference today to the water sector in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, just a word on the Green Climate Fund, the GCF is the largest global fund mandated to support uh, developing countries to raise and realize their nationally determined contributions uh, ambitions under the, under the Paris Agreement towards low emissions, climate resilient pathways, and it's dedicated to providing financing for projects to fight the worst effects of climate change. The GCF aspires to provide a 50-50 balance in both mitigation and adaptation. We currently have 173 projects uh, in our portfolio with $8.4 billion committed and a total, with a total value in the projects of over $30 billion. Now this slide gives an uh, indication of uh, the current status of GCF projects in the Asia Pacific region. 
as at May 2021, the 72 projects making up 42% of the GCF portfolio uh, with a total value of $3.3 billion um, in the Asia Pacific region, potentially reaching over 273 million beneficiaries. Uh, the slides you see of the eight projects that were approved uh, in 2021 are those that were approved at the last board meeting at B28 of the Green Climate Fund. Regarding water-related projects, so 39% of GCF projects are water-related. Um, kindly note, not all in the water sector, but all water-related. The total commitment to the water sector is $2.7 billion, and there are 54 such projects under implementation. Now, within the Asia-Pacific region, the GCF has 28 water-related projects. And these three that we highlight in Uzbekistan, Timor-Leste, and Jordan uh, were approved at the last board meeting. Um, I won't go into details about the different specifications of the projects, but they cover all the elements of the water sector. Now, let me speak a bit about the accreditation process of the GCF. So the GCF acts essentially as an interlocutor uh, taking funding from donors and channeling the funding into project implementation in developing countries. And therefore, we work through accredited entities. And in order to achieve accreditation at the GCF, um, entities submit applications which are scrutinized both by uh, colleagues in the Secretariat, but also by an independent panel. And these assessments are essentially to ensure that the entities meet the GCF's um, fiduciary standards and, and other investment criteria, and to ensure the mandates are aligned and they have proper capacity and are able to manage risks. Uh, the recommendations of the independent panel then go to the board of the GCF, which uh, if it's so minded then approves the application of the accredited entity. Thereafter, the entity engages in negotiation with the fund to enter into an accreditation master agreement, which is the basic legal agreement that governs the relationship between the entity and the Green Climate Fund. Um, an accredited entity is thereafter required to do a yearly self-assessment and then to reapply for accreditation after five years. So note there's a five-year reaccreditation uh, timeline. Now, in this slide, we just to highlight the business model of the GCF, as I've mentioned, uh, as, as this interlocutor of funds, we work with desig national designated authorities. Um, and as I said, also with accredited entities in the implementation of projects. And the financial instruments that we apply uh, range from grants, loans, guarantees, and equity. And we implement our operations through both programs and projects. Uh, programs essentially to enhance the capacity of national entities to, um, to engage with the GCF. Uh, and that's a unique feature of the GCF, uh, supporting uh, readiness programs and project preparation programs of, of our credit and of our uh, entities and countries. So the accreditation process and the due diligence and compliance functions are uh, sort of um, linear processes that are administered by the Secretariat, um, both to see, pro, um, to see entities through accreditation, perform due diligence um, um, ahead of projects, and also to ensure compliance. Now, the Independent Integrity Unit then ensures that the GCF Integrity Framework, which I will explain in a minute, um, is applied, the provisions and the standards are applied in all of GCF operations in projects. And also we conduct uh, certain proactive measures in order to assess the integrity and the standards that are applied in our projects. And of course, the investigative response is, is sort of the, uh, the last response. Now, the mission of the Independent Integrity Unit is to ensure that GCF stakeholders adhere to the highest standards of integrity in order to safeguard the lawful and efficient utilization of GCF resources. 
Um, our vision is to be the global leader in climate finance integrity and to provide strategic leadership by creating strategic alliances with partners and stakeholders. The next slide, please. Um, now, this slide represents the integrity framework that we have built in the last four years around the work of the GCF. The policy on prohibited practices is the grand norm of uh, GCF integrity policies, and it sets out the major prohibitions and and the um, and 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 the standards that we apply in GCF financing. Uh, I would just highlight a couple of very important policies. Uh, all of them are important in standards, but a couple that stand out: the anti-money laundering and uh, countering the financing of terrorism policy is a very important element of the GCF integrity legal framework, which seeks to prevent the use of GCF resources either for money laundering or for terrorist financing. And you would understand that this is a really important element uh, that establishes credibility for the fund. Uh, furthermore, the policy on sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment seeks to prevent in GCF projects and programs um, the rights of of, uh, of of women and 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 other other groups against sexual exploitation and abuse, and I think you would appreciate the importance of this as well. We also have a policy on the protection of whistleblowers and witnesses, which is an important legal framework for protected reporting, and it imposes a duty on all GCF staff to report any um, potential violations or abuses of our integrity standards. Now we do have in the investigation uh, frame, a, a very uh, well articulated um, set of standards, which are going to the board very shortly for its approval, that guides all of the processes that we undertake in, in an investigation to ensure that investigations are both uh, fair and comply with due process. And only last week, the board approved the administrative remedies and exclusions policy, which then provides the framework for sanctioning entities that breach the prohibited practices uh, of, the, of the fund. Now, a quick word on our integrity tools. So we've designed a number of tools that enable us to uh, essentially uh, deliver on our mandate. And these are digital forensics and data analytics tools an integrity due diligence platform, uh, the investigation standards, which I referred to a minute ago, our work in outreach and capacity building, our proactive integrity reviews, which we apply in projects, and also the function that we undertake in providing advisories on policy implementation. And let me take uh, each one um, in the short term that I have. So the digital forensics and data analytics uh, function and the integrity due diligence platform. Um, they're based conceptually on the notion that one ounce of, of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So we, we deliberately seek to create um, uh, the opportunity for us to detect and to, and to mitigate any um, uh, integrity violations even before they occur. How do we do this? By creating the capacity to, uh, to exploit uh, electronic data, to analyze and process collected data into actionable information uh, in the, for the use in investigation process, and also to design a, a data input um, uh, and data and, and integrity red flag detection uh, system, um, which proactively then determines where there might be potential um, potential violations. Um, our investigation standards, I've spoken about that. Next slide, please. Um, we do then uh, engage in extensive outreach with our stakeholders. Uh, we had the first integrity forum, GCF integrity forum in 2019, at the back end of the COP25 uh, in Madrid. And in this forum, we brought 21 organizations related to the GCF um, with 30 participants into a forum where we discussed the fiduciary standards of the GCF and how to apply them. Um, 
we would do this annually. The pandemic obviously set us back last year, but we have the next one uh, also on the sidelines of COP26 in Glasgow later this year. Now, the Peer-to-Peer -peer Learning Alliance is an innovative um, a platform which was designed by, the, by Transparency International and is implemented with the support of, um, of, uh, of partners, including the German Cooperation Agency. And in this uh, forum, we bring together a small cluster of, of GCF partners for shared learning and for, um, uh, and for, and for uh, developing standards that meet with the GCF uh, requirements. Uh, the next slide, please. Our proactive integrity reviews are, are spoken to that. The advisories on policy implementation we provide to the board um, every, every uh, year, uh, an advisory on how policies have been implemented. And we also provide uh, on request to stakeholders uh, as they may, may require. Next slide, please. And this is how we integrate all of our tools in GCF operations from accreditation through project approval project implementation and beyond, using all of these tools at the various uh, points to, uh, to mainstream and to ensure the active implementation of our integrity standards. Next slide, please. So the key takeaways that I would offer from this presentation is one, our logo, as I would urge you to remember, is 0% corruption, 100% climate action. And that's the motor by which we conduct our activities at the GCF. Uh, integrity helps to ensure that climate actions achieve the best results and benefits, particularly here in the water sector in the Asia Pacific. And, and we note the transformational, transformational impact that this has for the people and for the planet. And so we also ensure a comprehensive approach in our integrity policies from prevention through detection and investigation and remediation uh, and we apply all of these innovative tools. Accredited entities, I must stress, are required to comply with GCF fiduciary standards in order to receive project funding. Um, and our partners are more than welcome. We provide as much support as we can from the IAU to build uh, integrity capacity. And um, I would state as well that we, uh, at the integrity unit, uh, receive uh, Great support from the from the GCF secretary, from the executive director Yannick Lamarek, and as well as from the board. Uh, and in this way, we are able to um, to deliver on our mandate. And we look to continue to build strategic alliances. And, and we're more than happy to be to partner. Uh, and as we have created a partnership with the Water Integrity Unit, we look also to creating further partnerships in the water sector for the delivery of our. Uh, I will mind it. Thank you. I think I hope I've kept to the 15 minutes. Apologies for rushing through the presentation at the last point. Let me now uh, hand over uh, to my colleague Maria Prado um, de Gracia, who is with the uh, infrastructure um, with cost, uh, the um, infrastructure integrity. Uh, for, Thank forgive you, me, Sandra. Maria. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Let me just put share my screen now. That just me know if if it's screen all right now you can see my screen okay it's fine it's fine maria okay uh thank you so much for the invitation uh particularly to discuss such a uh, important topic as water integrity so i will look at integrity from the perspective of uh infrastructure and particularly i'm going to be using uh, infrastructure projects there we review under the cost assurance process as really the basis as, uh, as the basis and the findings for, for this presentation. So very quickly, first I'm just looking to explain to you what cost is and the approach that we adopt. And then the idea is based on the sample of the water projects that is in our database. 
is to look into uh, the common integrity issues that we have identified. And based on that, you know, based on those common uh, vulnerabilities, those common bottlenecks, the idea is to trying to leverage those by looking at those, trying to leverage so we can use those to drive positive change for, for the sector. So cost, uh, it is a global multi-stakeholder initiative. We are present in 19 countries and, and growing. So we really work with governments, uh, construction industry and civil society to improve transparency, accountability and participation in the infrastructure uh, sector. And the way that cost does it is by really uh, supporting procuring entities in the disclosure and in the use of uh, in information from construction projects and construction uh, data. And cost also uh, supports also to create more spaces for trust, for collaboration and for inclusion and giving voice to different stakeholders in the process of delivering infrastructure projects. The idea being that, uh, you know, the result, the end result of it is infrastructure that is more inclusive, that's really meeting people's needs, uh, bigger priorities in countries and regions, and uh, is not leaving anybody uh, behind. Very uh, quickly uh, showing to you here in this slide, it's uh, the key core features that are really supporting the cost approach. And if you, all of those different, the score features that are really attached to governance values. So we started here, the idea of disclosure, which is really connected to the principle of transparency. So the way that cost applies disclosure is by really providing a guidance, providing a template to procuring entities and what information is to be disclosed throughout the project cycle. So it is this, our standard, it is a cost infrastructure data standard. So we provide this guidance so procuring entities know what information is recommended for disclosure and to put it into the public uh, domain. And the OC for IDS, which is developed in partnership with OCP, which is uh, in terms of content is the same as the cost IDS, but it's just for using the format of the OCDS that was mentioned by on Barbara's presentation is just using the OCDS format, is using the open uh, data format. So it's the same in terms of content, but using this open technology, open data technology. The multi-stakeholder approach that I mentioned before is the uh, idea of collaboration, participation of different stakeholders. Social accountability is really using the data, the information that is disclosed so that a civil society, media, journalists can really ask the right questions and, re and really uh, render uh, authorities to account. And the assurance that I'll be kind of focusing here today, which is uh, an independent review of a sample of infrastructure projects with two purposes in mind. Uh, basically one is just to assess the level of disclosure in terms of quantity and the quality of the information that is uh, disclosed and also to raise red flags or issues of concern in those projects that are being assessed. And in a way, assurance ties together the other elements because it uses information that is disclosed. It applies a multi-stakeholder uh, approach that engages with different, um, in different groups and the product of assurance, the findings is used for the purpose of social accountability. So just to give you an idea what uh, the cost approach uh, does. So it's just what I'm, we are going to be looking here to our sample. It is 46 projects between 2016 and uh, May 20, uh, 2021. So it is uh, a small sample. I'm saying that from, from the beginning. So I'm not trying to make any uh, statistical analysis or quantitative uh, study or anything. It's just really sharing findings uh, from our database that might help to shine some light in those fragilities uh, of the sector and help us rethink on how can you leverage those fragilities to, to make positive change. So that represents 11% of our total projects in assurance, equivalent of uh, 430 million US dollars. And projects are implemented in seven countries that are cost members, spread from different regions, different scopes as well. So ranging from more simple to more co uh, complex projects 
mostly from federal entities, but also including municipalities and state uh, agencies. So in terms of transparency, just giving you some of the uh, highlights that you have, uh, what we noted is that looking to those projects in the water sector, 50% of the data points from our standard, 50% of those are commonly disclosed by procurement entities, which means that half of what the standards recommended to be put in the public domain, it's not disclosed. And this, you know, just to give you an idea, this places the water sector as less transparent, as, sorry, as more transparent than the healthcare projects, but less transparent than the road uh, sector. It's just using our database from, uh, the, from assurance. So just to give you an idea where the, the water sector is a bit placed. Uh, so Uganda was the one that really showed uh, the lowest rates and Thailand was the highest rates in terms of disclosure based on the cost data standard. And what we noted in, in the water sector is just is really based on the procuring entity that is implementing the, the infrastructure project. Because of the, is the, really because it's a sector that is highly fragmented, it, it, you have different entities that are implementing different from the road sector, for example, that you normally have one agency, for example, a road, uh, a road agency just implementing it. Um, in the other sector, you have different entities and you've seen that very clearly in Afghanistan. For example, that you have projects that are implemented by the Minister of Energy and Water, for example. The, high, the, level, the level of transparency was really high. So more than 70% of, uh, of our standard has been found on, on the data portals in Afghanistan. Whereas if you look at projects implemented by the Minister of Urban Development or Minister of uh, Rural Development, for example, this percentage drops to 40%. Uh, percent. So it's really up to internal processes, procedures and practices from procuring entities that is, seems to be defining the level of transparency uh, found on those projects. And another trend that in this point is not specifically to the water sector, but is a trend that we uh, we see in general to infrastructure projects is that the level of transparency it declines as the project evolves, which means that when you actually goes to the uh, stages where you're really going to find more red flags, it's really like when you go to implementation stages, where you have issues of delays, you have overruns, and you have more pro problematic points being raised, that you have more uh, issues or in terms of transparency, you have more. Um, visibility gaps and also this was also noted in the water projects. In addition to the, these issues of transparency, which was also noted in those projects is, uh, is not only about transparency or the 50% that's not there, but it's also the information that is available is really uh, kind of like scattered around in different places. So it's difficult to find it because the information is not systematically disclosed, which means the information is sparse, which creates risks for adequate accountability. So it is issues of transparency and issues really to challenges to find where the information that is available, where it actually is because it's spread throughout different places, different portals, different websites, for example. Moving more specific to the red flags, um, there's two different areas where actually, uh, these were uh, mostly found the pro problematic areas in terms of integrity issues planning stages and tender uh, in the infrastructure, infrastructure projects. So planning, they're mostly related to the lack of feasibility studies and inadequate preparation leading to the need to, to do more additional works during uh, project uh, implementation. We're looking to the first one. So how the lack of feasibility study relates to integrity issues. So for example, first, if you don't have a feasibility study, means that procuring entities, they are not able to compare different project alternatives. And because of that, it means that the, by not having this balancing of alternatives, uh, the, the, the allocation of uh, public resources might not be the most efficient one, might not be the optimal one. Also, if you don't have feasibility studies, it might open the room for uh, political capture, you might have projects that are selected not based on technical grounds, more, more on political, personal grounds. You might also even have uh, 
situations or open the room for tender irregularities as well, because you can have, without those visibility study creating technical boundaries, you can even a, a proposal, a tender proposal might be selected that is overly designed to create um, really leading to the, the famous uh, white elephant projects, for example, leading to costs that are not necessary. And in the other uh, situation about the inadequate preparation, is those additional costs is all leading to issues related to uh, financial integrity of projects because you have uh, unnecessary costs being added because either because you, uh, you don't, you have a scope of work that are not being anticipated and being added uh, unnecessarily, either because it was not, it was uh, not being adequately served from the beginning and creates room for this uh, being uh, after that uh, being included without uh, need. In, ca in case of tender, there's three areas was irregularities, inconsistent and questionable decisions. I'm going to go quickly here because of time, but irregularities when you see tender rules being breached, for example, if you have emergency procurement being used without being the case, or you have direct assignment of a contract without competition, without really justification for that, you inconsistence, for example, when you have tender rules being changed in the middle of the, the procedures after, for example, some bidders already being disqualified and without being uh, really being reconsidered to the, to the tender, really creating possibility of uh, favor, uh, favoritism, questionable decision in the same sense when you're limited to a certain region for, for bidders to participate is really leading to issues that you create this favoritism and leading to questions uh, why this had been put in place and, uh, and really putting those gray areas in terms of integrity. Now I'd like to go quickly to two projects that I selected, one in Thailand and one in Afghanistan, just to briefly look at uh, with you, just to say that when you, in the water sector, when integrity issues are in question, it's not only about delays, it's not only about over costs, it's just really, there are way more things at stake. There are social impacts, environmental impacts, there are uh, issues about water availability. So this project in Thailand, it was about uh, reservoir capacity and uh, the, it was just to improve also a water storage. So the first white flag that was raised here in the assurance process was the uh, environmental impact assessment was not available. And there was even questions raised by assurance if it was actually even developed, was even uh, conducted, which was quite surprising by the picture you can see was a very complex project that had really a lot of impacts in the surrounding community, in the environment itself. The community was not consulted, the community was not informed. So it was not surprising as well that um, the assurance team uh, reported that there had been conflicts in the beginning when the project started with the communities because of the lack of communication, the lack of engagement. They really were not aware the project was about to start. There were also conflicts related to compensation of land, issues with uh, the, the uh, environmental a road collapse, which put in question as well if proper health and safety uh, issues had been duly co considered and duly assessed by the project. The villages uh, also presented concerns to the assurance team about they have been prevented from using the water from the, the canal, which really contradicts the whole purpose of, you know, if we're supposed to improve capacity for the water storage for agriculture, but they have been prevented from using that as well. This project has been followed by the assurance team for three years because exactly uh, the impact they created. And what happened was that the project is now suspended because after several delays and uh, the, the procuring entity decided to terminate the contract. So which means that the schedule that had been uh, planned, it's now uh, all uh, really just uh, all on the dry drain because it cannot be completed. So there is impact in, not in terms of water availability because not only the villagers cannot use the water, but now the project is not under operation. So it is about you know how the impact can really, really bigger if not those integrity points are not checked and those red flags are not properly assessed from, from the beginning. The second one is in Afghanistan and it's a project for water supply network. The issue here is the design was really placed very close to the mountains 
did not consider that the fact that, you know, by putting it there without the proper consideration, it was uh, the potential risk for flooding and also rocks could to kind of uh, fall in there and risk all the, the structure. So it was really considering like uh, inadequate survey, environmental assessment was not uh, properly developed. Assurance also uh, red flag the fact that there's no uh, lack of maintenance. So here there's a combination of many of the red flags as well that put integrity um, uh, gray areas here into consideration. So it was a blind design. Why that happened or not happen? No adequate assessments in different areas here. No social environmental assessments. Consultation for the public did not consider. No maintenance being carried out. And also no impact in terms of climate because of the flooding, which is unknown in that, in that region. So that creates uh, increased risks for the project operation, put at risk the water availability and the community that really depends on that for uh, the water supply. And just to finish here, um, just using the, our working cost and say, also in the case of Afghanistan, just we, we noted that by really getting pinpointing those red flags and by using a, a collective approach and multi-stakeholder approach and really trying to uh, identify and shine a light when these fragilities and these vulnerabilities are. The, the authorities in Afghanistan, they really uh, established this backup unity to focus on designs, which was one of the issues. And we need to build the technical capacity on that. So they resurveyed more than 300 projects. They really redesigned uh, more other 200, really considering careful the other impact in terms of climate, social and environmental consideration and really taking on board this approach of, uh, as being pointed out in, in, during assurance, helping to close the, uh, maybe those back doors uh, in terms of what, trying to correct those malpractices in planning, tender uh, and delivery, trying to low the risk on future non-operational uh, projects. And I think it really puts the issue on, you know, collaboration, stakeholder engagement and participation as a really important way of building this together. So I think it is an example, yes, you might think it is just a drop in the ocean, but I really think it is a sea change that really brings us more closer to get achieving the SDG 6, really achieving closer, you know, to getting more uh, water and, uh, and sewage systems for, uh, for a bigger portion of the population. And just to, to finish in terms of recommendation, because where we see it is a sector that is still uh, experience issues of transparency and accountability. So it's still really key to improve transparency, and really apply uh, international rec recognized standards such as cost, where the information in, of projects it is disclosed in a systematic way, in a consolidated manner throughout the project cycle, and really working to leverage stakeholder participation and engagement so it can help to pinpoint and uh, identify risks and different uh, gray areas in planning and delivery of the water infrastructure. So thank you very much. Apologize if I might have overrun a bit my time. So uh, Binayak over uh, is the program coordinator from WIN. So over to you now. I'm just going to stop sharing now. Thanks, uh, Maria. I will now put on my presentation and quickly go through it. Um, can you, Maria, take down? Let me check. Maria, can you remove your? Oh, good. Sorry. So you can. Uh, See the presentation. Uh, very quickly, I just want to share some case practices uh, where we and partners have been involved in the Asia Pacific region, just to give you a flavor of like, you know, what kind of projects and what actually it means when you talk about integrity management more practically. Uh, so I'll start with uh, Nepal, where we work with um, which us as our key partner. And uh, just to very briefly uh, mention that like, when talking about integrity or let's say a sensitive topic of corruption, when you are working in a country, 
you have to approach it very differently because uh, it's sensitive and it can obviously lead to uh, different kind of negative outcomes. So in Nepal, for example, we started first by engaging with the government at the highest level, with the ministries, to discuss with them what are the positive aspects of integrity as against corruption. Following that, uh, when they were more on board, we started looking at what are the different options of working. And one is like engaging at a policy level, looking at the different policies and laws. So in Nepal, at that time, when Nepal was going through this uh, decentralization, they are also working on their WASH and IWRM sector plan. And through an engagement of over more than two years, we managed to get uh, integrity into the document. However, this docu uh, document is still to be finalized because of the decentralization. There have been many changes in Nepal. Then at a local level, working with communities, we helped in uh, making the local uh, government officials uh, use a community radio to inform the people about uh, budget for WASH projects in, in these districts, which was very well received. And they also published an investing investment plan, which was distributed uh, within the districts. And then um, another important point is that towards the end of this project, we uh, integrated integrity in the water user master plan, which is the main uh, uh, document uh, which Helvitas uh, works with in Nepal and then has been adopted by other partners and at a local level, a uh, watershed level, and they're making their IWRM plan. So this is now integrated in their master plan. Quickly, uh, Bangladesh is the second country I want to talk about, which is wind's focus country. So we have been engaged there for quite some time. We also have a network in Bangladesh called the Bangladesh Water Integrity Network, consisting of more than 15 organizations and individuals who jointly advocate for integrity in the country. And uh, again, in Bangladesh, the initiation, uh, what we started with is like looking at a quick assessment of the water policies and laws from integrity and from transparency, accountability, participation and anti-corruption perspective, what we call TAPA. And this helped us in aligning uh, the work with the National Integrity Strategy of Bangladesh, which is also very interesting, which was developed in collaboration with the Japanese aid agency in 2012, and Bangladesh is uh, trying to apply this uh, across different sectors. And then at a project level, what I want to mention is what Barbara had mentioned about the integrity management toolbox. We have uh, been working with water utilities in Bangladesh, and uh, the approach is to see how we can strengthen integrity within the systems, how uh, we can help in uh, jointly identifying risks with red flags and then apply certain tools to, uh, let's say, strengthen the system, improve performance, and it helps in also change management within the organization. So you can see on the slides below where uh, the integrity management toolbox is very briefly um, uh, explained. The process. We have a preparatory phase. We have workshop phase where we identify risks and we look at uh, developing a roadmap. A roadmap is developed and then we implement the roadmap. And this is a process uh, which can take a bit of time. Uh, what we are now looking forward is like how it can lead to an integrity plan. So we started working with Khulna in Bangladesh and then uh, there was interest because of what we have been doing with Khulna. There were interest from other utilities in Bangladesh and at the moment we were working with three other, two other utilities, uh, Rashtrahi and Chicago. And in terms of quickly results, um, we work with the business plan, for example, of a utility. And we, uh, what we have achieved, for example, are like establishment of e-procurement process in Kulna, or uh, utilities have started public hearing with utility customers, or for instance, field inspection mechanisms by uh, field officials uh, of the utility have improved compared to before. So there are many uh, such examples we can share uh, later on these details. We also undertake advocacy activities in Bangladesh where roundtable on integrity management is uh, undertaken where the utilities exchange knowledge among each other, but mo moderated by the media, which makes it open to the public. And also uh, high government officials and ministers also have participated in, in the 2020 edition. And uh, to mention that we also working on school uh, wash sanitation, uh, looking at it from more of the gender and inclusion perspective in uh, remote regions, which are climate affected uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, the third 
is, is from our partner organization, Caritas, and they are using the integrity management toolbox. It has been adapted for small water uh, farmer groups. And I think there were some questions in the chat, like how do you work with beyond uh, wash and you know, utilities? And here is an example of working with uh, within water resource management and agriculture, where uh, the toolbox has been adapted and uh, it's again with the different stakeholder groups, uh, an accountability mechanism has been built by uh, which they understand like what are the roles and responsibilities of different stakeholders and how they are actually able to interact better. And then a guidance system has been developed uh, for collaboration among the several user groups. Uh, there are more achievements in this project which is ongoing in Cambodia and they are uh, looking for further this can be embedded in the policy process in Cambodia. Another the example I want to share is uh, from Indonesia, which is interesting, uh, where we engaged it at the river basin with the Brantas River Basin and the Jas Perun Jasatita, the, uh, the state owned enterprise, uh, was our main partner. And it's a very complicated process where you have to involve many uh, stakeholder groups, including irrigation agencies, hydropower companies, uh, cities, municipalities, uh, etc. And this process involved initially a sustained engagement with different stakeholders to convince them to work on the topic of integrity. Um, and then uh, in this case, the integrity management toolbox had to adapt and also identify common tools which different stakeholders can jointly apply. And it's also important to see where can we apply because every organization has their own interests, own uh, priorities. And what we found there is like to find a common uh, issue and that was identified within, uh, in relation to the development of the master plan for pollution management in the Surabaya. And I think there was a question about pollution management. Here I can say like, this is how we tried to approach it. And ultimately what it did was establishing a community of practice among the stakeholders to address integrity issues. Uh, so these are the four case studies which I wanted to briefly share. And to mention that like uh, our work over these years, uh, what we have are tools and methodologies which are adaptable and they can be uh, adapted not only within the water uh, sector, but can be picked up uh, beyond water sector. And just to inform that Transparency International Bangladesh took our in uh, integrity management toolbox and adapted it for health and education sector. They are scalable and we already have started developing what we call a uh, pool of integrity coaches uh, who support us in the implementation of such projects. And here is just uh, an example of a publication which covered the case study from Kulna. And lastly, just before I end, I just wanted to share a set of joint statement from the three organizations which uh, presented today. What you would like in the Asia Pacific region, we would like to say is like raising the ambition and empowering integrity action. Recognize the in indispensable role of integrity in the water sector in achieving impactful climate action, among others. Advocate for collective action towards enhanced integrity for water security. Ensure that current and future investments for water infrastructure and climate projects are appropriately utilized and accounted for. Support knowledge and capacity building uh, in relation to transparency, accountability, participation, and anti-corruption. Apply available and well-established frameworks, tools, and methodologies, some of which were shared today for assessing integrity risks and strengthening integrity. And commit to ensuring continued support in fulfilling the agenda for sustainable climate finance, which I think should be extended to the water sector also. Zero percent corruption, 100% climate action. Thank you. I'd like to hand back to Ravi or Yumiko. Thank you, Binayak. So, Ravi. Yeah, so this has been a fascinating tour de force of four or three organizations with their different experiences uh, in, the, in the area of integrity. And it's included uh, structural changes like a structural issues such as an independent integrity unit such as in the Global Climate Fund the issue of transparency of information as in cost and the issue of application of tools and so on in, uh, in the case of uh, WIN. First of all, I think this is an excellent opportunity for at least these three organizations to ensure that 
it is the basis of a firm partnership between the three of you. Barbara, is, is that something that you would agree? Because it covers just not water and sanitation, it covers infrastructure and it covers climate change. It covers a, a much bigger look at the water sector than just water and sanitation, which is, um, which is the kind of thing that normally people do. So that's one. The other one is, assuming that we have to make uh, recommendations to political leaders, let's imagine that it's political leaders. What makes a statement compelling rather than just interesting? So would you three organizations be able to work together to develop just a couple of sentences, no more, because you know, there, there are other things to be also put in and the attention span of political leaders is very limited. To make sure that the issue of making the case for integrity, Barbara made a very interesting case of $5 billion. I mean, that should make anyone sit up. And then making it happen, all the other um, presentations on how, how, how integrity can be mainstreamed so that it becomes part of a process and not some uh, not some um, activity which is uh, which is sort of superficial or add on becomes the core of practice is it possible for the three organizations to work together to produce a single uh, recommendation or a couple of sentences of a recommendation that covers making the case and making it happen is that possible so that's my question to the three organizations and you can answer as you wish. Then we'll go to the other questions. Ravi, can I, can I come in here? Sure. Um, first of all, to say that, that, that Win is already working with, with GCF and with, and with COST. Um, and it is particularly because of that um, ability to, to, to get the reach and the impact and the different aspects and the different expertise that comes from the different organizations, uh, much like I was talking about multi-stakeholder partnerships. Uh, this is a, in a sense, multi-stakeholder partnership. It brings together uh, a range of, of skills and expertise. And as you say, uh, not all limited to the, to the, the wash sector. Um, so we are working together and it's, that's part of the, the, the strength, I think. Uh, certainly, I think that we could work to put together a, a short and, and impactful statement uh, from the three organizations. Uh, to try and motivate for, for, for integrity. Um, so yes, you've put a challenge to us. I think we will work together and, and, and do that happily. So put yourself in the, in, the, in the shoes of a political leader. What makes me sit up, you know, or give me sleepless nights or whatever, you know, or makes me sleep properly. Uh, so if you can do making the case and making it happen, that will be a huge uh, step forward for us in trying to put it in the in the statement, in the declaration. So thank you very much. Now I think uh, we'll throw it open to the floor. For those of you who have not been able to get your questions answered in this particular session, do not despair. You can always write in to, um, to, uh, to Yumiko, to Yumiko-san, and she will request these, the, partic uh, the presenters, presenting organizations to respond. So your, your job's not done yet, Barbara, Ibrahim, Maria, and, um, and Vinayak. Okay. Okay, ba um, uh, Yumiko, can, you, can we go on to the questions, please, chat box? Yes, thank, thank you, Ravi. And I also thank you for all speakers to uh, deliver your rich content of the presentation. Now, I would like to collect the question from the Q&A box. One question is coming from Lisa. She is asking all uh, of your speaker about what incentive they use to bring uh, the development broker to enhance water integrity on the ground. And uh, what do you help in triggering change mindset? when it comes to these issues, if the culture of corruption may be the norm. Thank you for your answer. Gosh, that's a big question. Anyone wants to venture 
a quick answer because we've got other questions. Yes. Vinayak, Maria, yeah. Ibrahim. Yeah, I uh, maybe uh, very briefly, uh, as I mentioned that like approaching the topic is very uh, sensitive and complicated. So uh, we try to, uh, let's say, work with a narrative which uh, is welcoming in, in, the, in the context of the partner, the country, etc. So um, I think uh, what is important is to emphasize more on the integrity side, the positive side, to look at what are the benefits uh, that are there instead of talking about corruption, instead of talking about fraud, which can be uh, negative. That comes later, uh, but first is the preventive side. We should, uh, we should try to focus on that. And we have some examples that uh, definitely sure will be useful to take forward. Thank you, Bernard. Ravi, can I, can I come in here? Yeah, sure, sure, Barbara. And, and, and Lisa, thank you for the question. I looked at it and, and, I, and I didn't answer it because it requires, it's a, complex, it's a very complex question. I think that one of the things is that if you, 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 you need to change the context within which those people are operating. Um, and so that the incentives actually, actually shift. And that, going back to it, it requires a, a, a change program uh, a change management program and a, and a shift of the culture within which um, development is happening. And I think also very critically, it requires, and it relates to another question that was, 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 was also asked uh, around international development finance and how the voices of communities are taken into account uh, rather than, than it being a discussion between um, the technical people, the politicians, and, and, the, and the development finance. And I think there is a, there is a need to actually be able to foreground uh, the, the voices of affected people um, and listen to them in order to actually shift uh, a lot of the discussion that is happening around uh, the development opportunities. But I'm not, I'm not suggesting that there's an easy answer. Yeah, just following on that, I think is that what we see in coursework is, is the same as you know, I just uh, mentioned, you know, just by framing the, the problem on positive terms and uh, instead of just using words, as, as you mentioned, as corruption, just trying to, to use in a different way as a positive narrative. And the assurance work that we're trying to do is exactly that, you know, trying to get to flag the problem, the issues without pointing fingers for, for anything and using that was how we can overcome to try to drive change in a in a different way, but even using a collaborative uh, approach and using it, how, how can that, you know, by flagging the, by pointing to the different vulnerabilities, how it can this be for, it can, it can be positive for all the sectors involved, the change it can be positive because the, in this case specifically, you know, the infrastructure projects are going to have, uh, be more operational for longer. So it has like required less maintenance. So it's going to be creating a, uh, longer terms, uh, more efficient, lo longer term uh, effect. So I think it's just framing that in more positive terms. And then what we see is just changing in the behavior of procuring entities. And just as we, I mentioned in the case of Afghanistan, it really opening the door for other stakeholders to, to take uh, a seat and also participate on uh, and changing the decision-making processes is, is how we can see this, this seed being planted for, for bigger changes to come later on. But uh, yeah, it's just a, a longer, uh, it's a baby steps on, on the way, not, it's not overnight. Okay, Ibrahim, do you want to add anything? Um, right, Ravi, uh, I, I actually wanted to weigh in on the question of uh, the role of political leaderships um, in enhancing integrity, if I may. Um, I think the GCF itself is a creation of political will mm. by the leaderships of, of states. Um, and I think that what we require to do as we implement uh, GCF projects is to ensure that we return to the states and to the donors uh, good value for their money. Um, and the way to do this, one of the main avenues of doing this is to ensure that all of our projects and our programs and our operations are conducted in an accountable and transparent manner. Um, and so it's, it's really important that as we focus 
on the water sector, which is critical to delivering um, uh, GCF, uh, the GCF mission, that we're able to assure um, stakeholders, particularly the providers of financing, that we are able to conduct our operations in an ethical, transparent, and accountable manner. Uh, if, if, I, if I may just take a minute to answer a question which was asked in the chat uh, by Flo, I believe, which is really important, on the question of human rights. And I, I've taken time to answer that in the chat, but if I may just elaborate it here, if I have a minute, is to say that the GCF takes very importantly the, um, the whole issue of human rights and its application in our financing. Um, uh, we have an elaborate policy framework that addresses human rights issues, but also an action plan that ensures that we implement um, rights for indigenous people, uh, for environmental and social safeguards, uh, for gender equality and social inclusion. Um, we have a unit that is a redress mechanism that ensures that where people are affected by projects, they're able to bring forward uh, um, their, their complaints, if any. Um, and we have a policy that provides for full disclosure of information. And in fact, the GCF operates on a default basis to provide full access to information, uh, except, except with, with certain very limited exceptions. And you would see that our board meetings are, are, are live webcast. Um, and all this is designed to ensure that not only uh, is our work conducted transparently and accountably, but also with respect to the rights of communities, of vulnerable people, the rights of stakeholders, and the benefits of uh, beneficiaries as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Ibrahim, I wanted to ask you, are there any simple indicators which will, which will say, yeah, yeah, it's working, it's worth the effort? Mm -hmm. it's, it's worth making these structural and practical changes and uh, changes in practice. Absolutely. We have uh, two means by which we evaluate the work of the GCF. One is through the operation, the um, Office of Project Monitoring. And they constantly monitor projects to ensure that they're delivering on, on, the, on the project uh, goals. But even more critical is the role of the Independent Evaluation Unit which is uh, a creation of the governing instrument of the GCF and, and the board, um, and which performs independent evaluations of GCF projects. And these evaluations cut across various themes, including, of course, uh, uh, themes around the uh, project objectives and themes around uh, the respect for human rights and, and accountability. And the independent evaluation unit does forward-looking evaluations as well as retroactive evaluations. And these are reported directly to the board and they, they are assessed uh, uh, across the board by all, all uh, countries and entities. So it's um, the, the, what we're trying to do with the Independent Integrity Unit, and I'll just mention this, is to utilize that, those same methods to find um, correlations between what we do and the impacts that uh, they have on the GCF, uh, um, on, on our projects. So how do we evaluate what, whether our policy uh, framework is delivering, whether our proactive initiatives are delivering on, on, on results in terms of building integrity and even our investigative responses. And uh, as we develop these tools further, we will have a, a a more empirical basis on which to report that here is the impact or of of the of the initiatives that we've developed. Um, so we we have a very holistic approach to it. We're looking to give uh, to to deliver projects that actually also deliver on value um, for all stakeholders. That's very important because people must recognize not experts but common sense. Yes, this works because. Something, something, something which I can relate to my life. Yeah, good, good, excellent. Okay, uh, Yumiko, any other questions? Yes, I would like to ask Binayak to respond to the question from Dr. Bruce. Okay, Binay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the question was um, 
for, for, okay, thanks for the great presentations. Thank you. Uh, working in both Nepal and India over the last 20 years, I have found the mainstreaming integrity is frequently ineffective. They are due to disinterest by senior bureaucrats, unwillingness to get programs and projects done, lethargy in short and poor leadership skills. Integrity is a Western idea promoted by international funding organizations. So why get involved? Uh, any thoughts from the panel? Um, I personally don't see it as a Western idea. I mean, definitely organizations who are uh, picking it up probably have uh, got uh, like based more in the West, but this is a topic, this is an issue that probably concerns everyone. And um, we all need to collaboratively promote it. Uh, our experiences working in South Asia, I mean, definitely what you were mentioning are, are the challenges. Are the, I mean, you cannot just let it go if their senior bureaucracy is unwilling or lethargic or whatever. But uh, what we have tried to do is also look at, uh, what, as Barbara mentioned, incentives. One is like to look at how can incentives be provided uh, for a particular uh, approach. Second is like identify the right leaders. We have identified leaders whom we call champions of integrity. In Nepal, I remember when we worked, we uh, had, had uh, strong support from uh, one of the joint secretaries who was, used to be in the Anti-Corruption Commission, and that really helped us. Similarly, in Bangladesh, working with the water utilities, we have now our champion. For example, the managing director of Khulna actually himself participates in providing mentoring on integrity management projects with other utilities. So definitely that's the way I see that uh, we can build, uh, instead of looking at like uh, this, this approach is applicable in, uh, in the global south and uh, in other regions. Thanks, uh, I will be happy if others also add something to it. One thing that I wanted to add, is there something that we can think about in terms of communication to the public about the importance of this issue? Are we missing a trick here? Are we not putting it in a language and in a way in which people can say, yeah, 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 this is good. Why doesn't my political representative adopt this? Is there, is there something that we can think about in terms of improving our public communications, either in terms of identifying indicators or, or expressing them or, or communicating them in a particular way? Ravi, can, can I respond here? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, you know, my, my sense is that when you talk to, to people, um, and no matter whether it's in the global south or the global north or, or wherever, a lot of people have a very good awareness uh, of, of what, is, what is going on around that there is corruption prevalent and, and how it is affecting things. Um, I don't think the challenge is around people knowing that it's there. I think the challenge is around supporting people to understand a, that it can be tackled, because I think sometimes people go, it's just a factor of the way we live, and it just is. Um, and so I think the, the, what, is, what is critical is, is conveying the message that it can be changed, uh, and that there are positive examples of where things have been changed, and how people can actually then go about getting involved in, in pushing for change. Uh, that for me is, is and, and that is something that, that, that Wynn tries to do. Obviously, um, you know, reaching everybody is, 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 is difficult, but I do think that that is the message that one needs to get across, whether it's from the work of, of GCF or the work of, of, of Win or COST or a number of other organizations. Um, and that was why I tried to highlight some case studies, because actually there's been a lot of very good work uh, that has been, has been done in, in actually tackling this. Quite often, re re reflecting on, on what Banayak was saying as well, quite often what you see is really some quite remarkable stuff driven by a champion um, who has, has, has seized upon the issue and has gone not on my watch um, and then leads a process that, that can result in some significant uh, change. But my sense is that that is, that is how um, one, one could go about the communication of this um, that it's around the communication of the action that can be taken, uh, not just around how bad corruption is, but guys, we can make a difference uh, and people are making a difference. Yeah, positive messaging rather than boys me. Right? Yeah. Okay. Maria, did you want to say something? Yes, I think uh, one point just to be made is about the power of technology today, because we can't see one point that we uh, 
we're saying about the new data points and new data standards. And is that we, we have now all the data analytics that was uh, mentioned also in the presentation from Ibrahim, and we see that in cost as well, is that when you have now this data analytics, it really opens, uh, really improves the way that you have civil society and even in the average citizen being able to identify those red flags more, more easily in the sense that those data analytics by being embedded in the data portals, for example, and, and if, if what you're doing in cost Ukraine, for example, it really shows that it helps because it, it, it automated the way that those red flags can be shown. So it's really a new, it's a game changer now. So I think it really helps to communicate. I think it's the point that you were saying is, at least from the perspective of infrastructure, it is a complex topic and also uh, corruption. It is to get this smoking gun for you to say it is, it is here. It's sometimes difficult for you to have the clear clarity on, on that. So I think with the advance of technology in our favor, is something that we're taking advantage on, on that. And we're working on win really to get more data points specific for the water sector and well to get this uh, use of open data standards. So we automated those red flags to make it easier for media. It was mentioned before, you know, so you have civil society and other organizations, uh, academia really looking into that and getting a new, uh, really strengthening how you can identify those red flags and really asking the question, really asking the, the right questions and saying, okay, why this, uh, this project was uh, located in here, why it was missing the environmental assessment here. So I think it just creates uh, an additional uh, push for another drive for, for change with this new wave of data and analytics. And I think we see that in the climate side that was mentioned by Ibrahim in uh, wins uh, in their own perspective and from cost as Thank well. You. Thank you very much, Maria. Now we're coming to the end of the session, 90 minutes, fascinating uh, discussions and conversations. So uh, what do we take away from all this? Well, in just sticking to Asia Pacific, which is the largest region in the world and the most diverse in terms of political, economic, cultural, and social apart from um, social systems and, shall we say, inclinations, it's going to be difficult to put together a simple message which resonates with everybody. So first of all, apologies for those people for, for countries from whom examples were not taken. We couldn't, the 48 countries, 48, 49 in this region, difficult to be able to do it for everybody. But I suppose there are what 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 comes across is there are common and common sense um, issues that are applicable across, irrespective of political systems or social and economic conditions, which are sensible and doable. And I think that's what we should concentrate on. So a huge thank you to the panelists. I mean to the presenters, Barbara, Ibrahim, Maria, and Vinay. Thank you for your, thank you for sticking more or less to 15 minutes and uh, for all the rich stuff that you have unloaded onto us. And thank you for agreeing for your homework, which is to produce one, I just remind, finished by reminding you of your homework. One or two crisp sentences about messaging, given the fact that Political leaders uh, are short attention spans and they need to attend to lots of things. So make it snappy and make it compelling. So thank you all very much. And I think uh, Yumiko has got a couple of announcements to make before we close. Yumiko? Thank you, Ravi. And also thank you for all the speakers to respond to very difficult question to very nicely and brightly. And I also thank you for responding to your question during uh, this webinar. Uh, I think most of the question coming from the audience was responded by sp speakers. But uh, I know we, we have some question left. So we will respond to the question by email after the webinar. So please wait for a moment but until the speaker responds. So and uh, uh, now I also thank you to all speak all the audience to participating in this webinar, and uh, 
asking various feedback and question to audience. It is very, very useful for us for our future works. Thank you. And we will consider all uh, feedback and uh, recommendation from the speaker of today's webinar for the uh, declaration document for the fourth APWS. Thank you so much for your re recommendation. Now, I would like to introduce the next webinar. 11th AP webinar will be organized on 30th June, Wednesday, from 4.30 p.m. in Japan time and 1 p.m. from India time. The topics we will focus is ground, focus, ground water, and uh, we will welcome the uh, two speakers from uh, Yumi, Dr. Aditi, and also uh, Argiam, local NGO, Miss Arumita, senior manager. Then we will discuss the pathway for resilience and sustainable groundwater management in Asia and the Pacific. So introducing some practical uh, uh, cases about the implementation of the national policy and also community practice implemented on the ground, making use of information technology. This webinar will show the, some emerging insight for Asia Pacific leadership about the operational model about the groundwater resource management. This webinar then discuss how to enhance political will to tackle the weak problem of water energy food nexus from groundwater conservation and the optimal use. So we will introduce the e registration uh, after this webinar, introducing the today's webinar's recording and presentation. So I cordially appreciate all the audience of today's webinar will continuously join the e 11th APW webinar. So last but not least, Please also take a few minutes to fill out the survey after the webinar. It will be anonymous. Then we will consider your answer for including future webinar. So thank you so much for joining the 10th AP webinar. I now would like to thank you to all speakers and also Ravi to uh, organize this webinar together with us. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Goodbye. Thank you so much for all the audience to join this webinar. Thank, Thank you all very much. We'll see you next Thank you. time. Appreciate it. Thank you and goodbye.